All right, good morning, ABC. Uh, we wanna look at two more attributes today. And the first one we wanna look at is the life of God. And so the word life is something that's maybe easier to, to, to um, describe than it is to explain, something to, to talk about than it is to kind of define. Uh, so what I wanna do, I wanna look at a couple things that in Norman Geisler in his systematic theology, uh, he talks about different Bible verses that talk about God being a living God. And then he talks about God as the source of life, God as the resurrector of life, God as the living bread and water, and God as the source of living words. And so I want to just kind of give us a feel for this. Uh, what he talks about in his, his chapter is that when we talk about the life of God, it's the aliveness of God, the activity and the flowingness of God, that God's not the static rock but that he lives and he moves and he changes things. And so God's movement, his activities, his being, it all flows out of his own intrinsic will. And all other finds find their life and energy in his gifting of life to them. No, no creature, nothing that's been created has life on its own. He hasn't given them life to sustain himself. It's a gift from him and he takes it back from them at the end. And so death is the opposite. Death implies no movement and emptiness of finality. Uh, death is the absence of life. It's not the opposition to life. And so we're going to look at that today, that God is life and everything else has life granted or given or lent to them. It's not their own. And so here's a, here's a couple examples in the Bible. The first one is from Deuteronomy chapter 5. Uh, th this is talking about the living God. I just want to give you kind of a feeling for this in the Bible, that the Bible really emphasizes this. Deuteronomy 5, verse 26. For what mortal man has ever heard the voice of the living God speaking out of fire as we have and survived? In Joshua 3.10, Joshua 3.10 uh, this is what Joshua says. This is how you will know that the living God is among you and that he will certainly drive out before you the Canaanites, Hittites, Hivites, Perizzites, and Girgashites, and Amorites, and Jebusites. See, the ark of the covenant of the Lord of all the earth will go into the Jordan of head, ahead of you. And they will witness this, this, this living God's power. He's not like other gods. He's alive. He's powerful. He's active. First, 17, um, first Samuel 17, this is a famous verse. First Samuel 17, verse 26. This is David and Goliath, and this is David's punchline. This is the, the powerful word that David shares to Goliath. Well, no, later he'll say this to, to Goliath too, but he says this to the men. David asked the men standing near him, what will be done for the man who kills this Philistine and removes this disgrace from Israel. Who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? And then later, later he even says that to he, he says that to him. That he's defying the armies of Israel, defying the armies of the Lord Almighty, and so God will destroy him. Uh, in 2 Kings 19, verse 4, Assyria is this powerful nation, and they're coming to, defy, um, to defeat Israel, and they're outside of the gates of Israel. And this is what um, Hezekiah's officials say to him. Uh, they're, they're all freaking out, and Isaiah, the prophet, says to them, Tell your master, King Hezekiah, this is what the Lord says. Do not be afraid of what you've heard. All these threats from this empire, this powerful empire, and you're a small little nation. These words that which you've heard of the underlings of the kings of Assyria have blasphemy. Listen. I'm going to put such a spirit in them that when he hears a certain report, he will return to his own country and there will have him cut down by the sword. Okay. It's the living God. They're, they've defied the living God. Second Corinthians, Second Kings 19, verse 5. And I actually 
missed the, the first four, it's, it's, it may be that the Lord your God will hear all the words of the field commander whom his master, the king of Assyria, has sent to ridicule the living God and that he will rebuke him for the words the Lord your God has heard. Therefore, pray for the remnant that still survives. And so God is saying, don't mess with me. I am the living God. I'm not an idea. I exist and I rule over all things. I'm alive. I give things their breath and I can take their breath away. Uh, here's, here's another example. I'm, gonna, I'm going fast through the Bible. There's so many verses about this in the Bible. But Daniel 6 verse 26. This is what it says about God. Uh, for he is the living God, and he endures forever. His kingdom will not be destroyed, and his dominion will never end. He rescues and saves. He performs signs and wonders in the heavens and on the earth. He has rescued Daniel from the power of the lions. This is the living God. In the New Testament, Jesus uh, is talking to Peter, and he says, Who do you say that I am? And Simon Peter answers, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. There's a whole bunch more of these verses here in the New Testament. Uh, I want to just hone in on John. John, one of the main themes in John is eternal life. His life is believing in the life of Jesus. And that Jesus himself says that he has life in himself. And so here's a couple verses in John 6. In John 6, we see this. It says, For just as the Father raises the dead and gives them life, so the Son gives life to whoever he is pleased to give it. John 6, verse 57. Just as the living Father sent me, and I live because of the Father, so the one who feeds on me will live because of me. Uh, and, and we're going to look at some other ones, how he is the resurrection of life later. What I want to do now is look at a couple verses where it says God as the source of our life. And so God is the one who gives life to all things. There is nothing that exists in the universe that exists and lives and breathes and has its being unless God has given it life. So Satan hasn't created any living beings. He has only distorted what is good. So Genesis 1 verse 21, it says, So God created the great creatures of the sea and every living and moving thing with which the water teems according to their kinds and every winged bird according to its own kind. Everything that God created is that it's alive came from him. In Deuteronomy uh, 32, verse 39. This is a very interesting verse. It says, See, now I myself am he. There is no God besides me. I put to death and I bring to life. I have wounded and I will heal. No one can deliver out of my hand. And so God brings to life and he also takes life away. God is the ultimate one who should be the one who decides people's fates and their eternities, their destinies. And here on earth, if he takes life or if he gives it, it's up to him. Here's some verses that talk about God as the resurrector of life. Uh, this is in Job 19, verses 25 to 26. It's, this is what Job says. He says, I know that my Redeemer lives, and that in the end I will stand upon the earth, and after my skin has been destroyed, yet in my flesh I will see God. I myself will see him with my own eyes, and I, not another, how my heart yearns within me. God is the one who gives life, and Job is expecting that, and he yearns for that. In John, Jesus himself says that he is the life. It's so interesting to see how Jesus talks about himself as if he is God. He uses the same attributes of God. He, he designates himself with actions that only God can do. And this is what Jesus says. Jesus says in, in verse 23, he says, Your brother will rise again. This is his brother Lazarus, her brother Lazarus, who's died. And Martha answered, I know he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. But Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection of life. He who believes in me will live even though he dies. 
and whoever lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? So Jesus is like, I can heal him right now. I can raise him to life right now. God is the living water and living bread. In, in the Gospel of John, Jesus says in John chapter 4, verse 10 and 11, he says, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that asks you for a drink, you would ask him and he would give you living water. And, and so water and bread are the essentials to a human being's physical sustenance. And Jesus is saying that he himself is the spiritual sustenance of a human being. In John 6, verse 51, Jesus says, I am the living bread that came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. This bread is my flesh, which I give for the life of the world. So there's something about Jesus' spirit, his, his nature, that he wants to share with human beings that they cannot receive apart from him. There's a, there's a physicality and a material type of life that human beings are experiencing, but there's another type of spiritual realm that we're not experiencing apart from Christ. And the last section that Norm Geyser talks about is God is the source of, of living words. And uh, I'm not going to read all those, but Acts 7, verse 38, Hebrews 4, verse 12, and 1 Peter 4, verse 5. Uh, check them out. The, the Word of God is alive. It is active. It creates life. The Word of God comes out of God's mouth and it creates. So in Genesis 1, God he speaks things and the Spirit brings them to life. The, the Spirit, who's the Lord and giver of life, works with the Father by enacting through the word. And so here's a question I have for us. I see this a lot on atheists, Reddit forums, and YouTube videos trying to um, destroy the credibility of Judaism and Christianity. And they say that if you look in Genesis 2, in Genesis 2, this is what it says. <clears throat> God builds the Garden of Eden and he's, he, he's uh, showing... Adam around his new home and he's showing him this beautiful place he's lived to live in. And then it says, The Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and to take care of it. And the Lord God commanded the man, You are free to eat from any tree in the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. For when you eat of it, you will surely die. And so Adam believed God. But in Genesis 3, in Genesis 3, uh, Eve is talking with the serpent. And he says, he said to the woman, did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, we may eat fruit from any trees in the garden. But God did, God did say you must not eat from the fruit of the tree that is in the middle of the garden. And you must not touch it or you will die. And this is what the snake says. He says, you will not surely die. For God knows when you eat of it, your eyes will be open and you will know you will be like God, knowing good and evil. And so there's a lot of people who say, can you see what happens? God's actually the one who's telling the lie, not the snake, because they don't die. They don't die. They, they live a full life and they have sons and, and they go on with their life. And so God's the liar and Satan, the snake, is actually telling the truth. And the funny thing is, is that based on the verses that we've already looked at and the understanding in the Bible of what it means to be spiritually alive is something very different in our world. And the problem is, is that we live in a physical, materialistic existence. Our worldview is a materialistic worldview that clouds our judgment when we read these verses and we're not reading them like Hebrews. But the Jewish people, the people who have a biblical understanding, see something very different in this text. They see some very clear evidence that there's shame, there's nakedness, and there's fear, there's competitiveness, there's blaming. Something has happened in the ontology and the, the sociology of these people. Spiritual death has happened. And so I need to ask the question, is there a real noticeable difference between what God says spiritual death is and spiritual life. 
Or is this simply a metaphor for living an upright or a wicked life? Is this just talking about psychologically ruining my life because I'm not living by good principles and I'm not getting along with people, I'm not being a universal global citizen? Or is God talking about something more? And so I want to give a warning to the churches in Canada that we have abandoned a major part of the gospel and then when people remind us that it's in the Bible, we just say, oh, I don't like that. That sounds like reform theology. Or that sounds like Martin Luther. And we don't recognize that this has been a paramount teaching in Scripture and in church history since the beginning. In Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 to 6, these words are specifically speaking about spiritual death. And this isn't a metaphor. There is something spiritually that has died in all human beings that needs to be resurrected by God himself in order for us to participate in the divine nature. But the problem is when human beings only look at the material world and we only judge being aliveness based on what we can see and what we can think and what we can believe about physical health and relational well-being, and that's all we can see, we are prone to misunderstand the Bible. This is not a metaphor. This is talking about our actual spirits. Ephesians 2, verses 1 to 6. As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins. You were dead. In which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and of the ruler of the kingdom of the air. We were still able to live and move and do the things that human beings could do, but there's a part of us that was really dead. So we were like walking zombies. We were the living dead. We were able to do human things, but not to the fullest human capacity. The spirit, And when we did all these things, when we were following the ruler of the kingdom of air, the spirit who is now at work and those who are disobedient, all of us who lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our sinful nature and following its desires and thoughts, like the rest, we were by nature objects of wrath. But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, literally made us alive. He didn't create a metaphor. He literally made us alive with Christ, even when we were dead in our transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved, and God raised us up with Christ. Now, Jesus says in John 3 that unless a man becomes born again, he cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. In 2 Peter verses 1 to 4, in 2 Peter verses 1 to 4, it, listen, listen to this, 2 Peter 1, sorry, verses 3 and 4. This is what it says. His divine power has given us everything we need for life and godliness through our knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and goodness. Through these he has given us very great and precious promises so that through them you may participate in the divine nature and escape the corruption the world caused by evil desires. This materialistic worldview creates this low-hanging fruit, and then it says this is what it means to be a Christian. This is what it means to have the life of God, and it talks and it describes about things that our world is capable of doing. But God is talking about a different type of life that he wants us to enter into him, with him. This is called eternal life. Jesus says that he wants us to have abundant life, not a plain Jane, uh, run-of-the-mill life the rest of the world can have without the Spirit of God. He's talking about a life that participates in the glory and the holiness of God, something that cannot be taken, cannot be discovered, but can only be given by God himself. God grants all physical life to all creatures, and he, he also grants spiritual life, a special type of spiritual life to all beings who believe in Jesus Christ and are redeemed by him. And they enter into what's called being in Christ and they start to participate in the divine nature of God himself. This is a totally different thing. And the question I have to ask for us is, is do we believe that this is just a metaphor or have we entered into the real spiritual life that Jesus has given 
Uh, if you've entered into it, it's unmistakable the difference between the spiritual death that Ephesians 2 is describing and the physical, or the story of the spiritual life that Ephesians 2 describes and grace enters our hearts. Have you uh, become born again? Have you been made alive by Christ? Has he illuminated your heart and changed your passions and desires and you become alive again and you're breathing and you're, you're witnessing the world the way that Adam and Eve did before they fell? the way that Jesus was while he was on earth? Or do you look at the world the way that the rest of the world does uh, in the brokenness and the tiredness in the spiritual death of being enslaved to the evil one? Have you received the spiritual life of God yet?